Welcome to Conference Highlights, recorded in front of a live audience at an evidence-based perioperative medicine, that's EBPOM conference. EBPOM are world leaders in perioperative education, so why not join us at our next meeting with a special discount for Top Med Talk subscribers. Look us up on www.ebpom, that's E-B-P-O-M, dot com. Top Med Talk. Again, without further ado, I'd like to um, present or introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Chereau. Uh Liz is a dear friend of ours at EBPOM, and, um, <laughs> and we are excited to hear um, more about your experience in leading a large single group towards excellence. So please, everyone, a round of applause for Liz. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming back from Snack. So it's nice to have a large group, and it's hard to follow Michael after that, though I think some of this will overlap. This is a relaxing, this is uh, a hopefully slightly entertaining um, talk, and I'm hoping afterwards actually that it's a little interactive and I, I might spur a little controversy. Um, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. Show of hands, how many obstetricians are in the room? Silence. <laughs> So, Michael, I gotcha. Okay, so you had two surgeons. I almost raised my hand because as an obstetrician, I'm a surgeon, right? I'm an obstetrician, and I see patients in the office. So I'm not an internist, never would claim to be. Um, but I'm going to talk about Axia Women's Health, uh, I, which has formed back in 2017. I'm going to go over a little bit of our history, who we are. Um, and then I'm going to dive right in to a little bit of something that just happened actually within the last six months. But I'm going to start with a little teaser. I am presenting the ERAS program on Sunday uh, for C-section. We've been doing that since uh, 2016, so I'm not going to talk about ERAS. Um, I am going to tell you how awesome the talk is and how Dr. Ket and I, who's anesthesia, partnered. So you need your partners. We started with a lot of data. We did a lot of collaboration, um, and we presented a pathway. Do you like how I'm leaning in, Michael? Got it? Got, like how I'm segueing right from his talk. And, and actually started an app for patients um, starting at 36 weeks so that they engaged in the process and followed them afterwards. And we actually had patient-generated data um, on satisfaction, breastfeeding, mood, all the things that none of you know a lot about um, because I'm the only obstetrician in the room, so that is always helpful. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Axia. So yes, I flew in from New Jersey. Um, and yes, you see the map over there. The, we are from north to south. Um, we are care centers that are doing OBGYN at its roots. We also include, um, I'm about exit eight, which is about the middle of the state. Um, the, you guys aren't laughing because you don't know New Jersey. So, <laughs> like, silence in the room. And anyone who's live streaming from home in Axia is laughing hysterically because I thought that was going to be the funniest joke I had today. Okay, so Philadelphia, um, we're sort of an enclave, and you can see the sort of that knee area. That's where this sets in. There were two huge groups um, on both sides of the Delaware uh, River that really were quality, um, like-minded uh, in our, our sense of, of what our mission was, which was bettering healthcare for women. We merged together in 2017, um, and we're talking over 270 providers. Uh, we do maternal fetal medicine, high-risk obstetrics, as well as urogynecology, the P world, um, at least that's what I like to call it. Um, I told you this is going to be fun. Reproductive uh, endocrinology, so you're talking about infertility. Um, we do breast imaging as well. And I, I'll get into some numbers afterwards if people want to know more detail. But that's who we are. Um, we, wanted to lead, we want to lead the way in improving women's health. We are actually the largest OBGYN group in the country. Um, yeah. Ooh. Right. Um, but really our mission, which I can get into mission statements and leadership roles, but as our core team, our, our mission became to create a more caring, connected, and progressive women's healthcare community. And I want to talk to that today specifically. I think there are lots of organizations out there that have mission statements that they necessarily put up and walk by every day or um, don't really talk to. But I want to give you a specific example today of what we've done. Um, the first of sort of our, our values was to think about innovating. 
and to embrace new ideas. So this is the American College of OBGYN. Again, none of you know. Um, this is their statement about opioid uh, use and during pregnancy uh, and abuse during pregnancy. So we talked about the naive patient, and I'm kind of like Michael. I, I have that. Most of my patients are opioid naive, right? Um, and how big of a crisis really is this? Well, I think the number one heroin overdose is in Philadelphia. That's kind of around where I work. Um, that being said, um, ACOG talks about one in 300, um, the, the one out of 300 women after delivering actually gets addicted to opioids. Um, on average, I'm delivering 250 babies a year. I'm very busy. That's a busy number. My, my particular care center does about 1,200 deliveries a year. So, so we are seeing this. Um, so we as a group talked about how can we do what ACOG says or is recommending and screening our patients. And so um, as a core group, and this is a shout out to my clinical team, um, Dr. Steve Krell, one a fantastic physician on the uh, Pennsylvania side, said we, we need to start to do this and how are we going to do this. ACOG recommended, their primary recommendation is to actually do a screening tool with a questionnaire. So there are nine page questionnaires, nine page questionnaires. You're a new OB pregnant patient. That is like not, you're not interested in answering that. You have questions about what to eat, what exactly are my appointments, do I exercise, what are you going to do to me, what's the genetic screening, nine page questionnaire. There is a four page questionnaire, it's not as valid. Could we talk about, could we do our own questionnaire? We, we, we literally went through all of these things um, debating within our, our clinical team. So we, we went to our providers. We, we went to the 275, I said 70, so I may be off, but um, in a, the 100 care centers across New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and we pulled them. We literally sent out a survey, and we didn't survey just the lead doc in the group or um, one person. We screened everybody and asked for their, their input. SurveyMonkey is super cool, by the way. Anyway, and I'm not sponsored by anybody, I should say that first. So we, we went to them and said, here are the surveys, here's the ACOG article, take a look, what do you think, what do you want to do? And the feedback overwhelmingly was actually, let's do a urine screen. Simple, we collect urine anyway, we do a culture at the very first obstetrical visit, why, why don't we do it? And Michael's wrinkling his brow back there thinking, hmm, you didn't do this standard. We're not a academic institution, which would have massive social workers to be able to refer, department to refer to. Um, we debated this within our, our team, and, and this is what we came up with. Um, but we wanted to work as a team. We wanted to be open and honest about the, this um, as a choice. And we really wanted to connect with our patients as human beings and each other about this choice. So, terrible slide. Um, so, <laughs> we wanted to have a pathway for, and, and I'm going to talk, shout outs to different people on my clinical team. Megan Morton, one of our strong, strong employees who works tirelessly um, and really set up within our EMR system about how, how do we schedule a patient, how do we get this done, who are we going to do this to. So, we decided to do new OB patients as they register. We wanted to inspire trust with the team that this pathway was set up. We always wanted to be respectful, so we, we didn't want to duplicate. If some care center was already doing this, we didn't want to duplicate this over and over again. Um, and we really wanted to consent. We wanted consent on board before a patient um, had this and show, show some compassion for the patient. So here's our consent. Okay, this is a little better slide. Um, so what, what you see is the different versions that we got to. And I can point out in the very beginning, they're, they're a little different, but not so much. And of course, we had lawyers vet these, right? That, that's like the big kick. And one of my counterparts is actually an MD, JD. So super influential to look through this. And she had already been doing a lot of this, which was helpful. Um, but we wanted to be honest with each other about how to do this. And fascinating to come find the feedback we got from the doctors was, if you read this carefully with that fine print, that we actually wrote that ACOG, right, the educational foundation of our practice, recommends urine drug screening. I just told you they actually recommended a questionnaire. So we got a ton of pushback on this. And this was already in the EMR system, in little laptops, little um, tablets in all the offices we had 
killed a few trees and Xeroxed some things. They weren't plastic, but we certainly were about to laminate them, and we were <laughs> ready to go um, with this. And we said, fine, we need to take that out, because honestly, we need to be, right, we need to be accountable, um, and we needed to be honest about it. So we took it out. <laughs> and then if you read this even further, it says, we will, if you are positive, we will send you to a maternal fetal medicine. So that's my shove you up the chain, please make sure this patient is okay for me to continue to take care of as a generalist. But again, there's recreational use of marijuana. There's, and again, we can talk about this in the Q&A. And what exactly are those impacts? And does that mean that the one person who is positive at her first visit, her next visit is negative and says, I'm never doing it again. I have to send her to a high-risk doctor so she's going to have, it might even be in my own care center. It might even be within my referral system. But is that an automatic? Um, lots of conversations with physicians who were um, debating this left and right. Of course, my MFM said, you will send this off. Um, and my general said, I don't always do that. What, what do we do? So we, we again, were right, ready to laminate, ready to be you know, right back into our computer system, which I think most of you know getting into any kind of EMR system and changing was just fraught with a lot. So I'm going to give another shout out to Megan Morton, who on a Friday night sat and redid every single one of these in our care centers. And I just told you there's over 100 care centers. Um, and changed it to we may. But words are important, right? Words are um, become very important. And we wanted to do what we say we will do. And um, we, again, wanted to act with integrity. So here's our pathway. We actually have a patient when they first come in. They have to have um, a urine collection. We, we literally gave our lab exactly how to process the specimen, what we're, what we're actually sending it for, from marijuana to opioids. And there's a long list up here um, and the details of it. Um, and then what do we do with the results? We actually send it out to an outside lab to verify it. And you might say, oh, my goodness, that sounds like a lot of work. That sounds like, but for our patients, right, we wanted to serve with excellence. We wanted to set the highest standards. And we want to anticipate their needs. So we have a list for clinical follow-up. We actually had a, a joint um, conversation with, and, a, a, and I don't want to get into names of who they are, but um, we have a, a direct contact to an addiction specialist within New Jersey and Pennsylvania with a, a designated number for our providers. So it's that pathway that we're generating uh, for patients and for providers to be taken care of immediately. And again, we, we really wanted to be able to do this by exceeding those expectations. So lastly, we wanted to value our patients, but we also wanted to value each other in this process. So we didn't just say, okay, we're going to throw this out to 100 care centers and here we go, because we just figured out after doing the consent that maybe we should slow it down a little bit. Right? So, we, so we vetted it in one trial in one care center. So in that care center, we did, um, uh, and again, I just got this actually from Megan this morning. That's my second shout out to her. Um, that we had 145 in this one care center um, urine screenings. And there were actually four positives, one for morphine, two for opioids, and Darvon. I haven't seen Darvon in like, I don't know. I think I finished residency. Well, I'm not going to tell you when I finished residency, but it was the 90s. And, and <laughs> that's the last line. I have a general surgeon who liked Darvon. Um, so I, I haven't seen, I'm just picking on poor Michael. Um, so that, that is um, sort of how, we, and, and let me tell you, this is a care center that turned around and said, oh, we don't have any opioid abuse in our care center. And I had physicians book, pushing back saying to me, um, as we started to unroll this, you know, we're not, just not going to see this. Um, and some of that's the naivete. And some of them said, what script should I even be saying to patients um, about what to do? And, and this, you know, this is a good story, right? This is the first one. We've, up to date, done 2,233 screens. And we launched this, I should have said this in the beginning, uh, February 11th. So, was it today, March something? Um, and we had 43 positives. 28 were marijuana. I think that's expected. <coughs> Um, or maybe I expected that. Five were opioids. Um, four, um, 
Buper, I can't even pronounce this one, the suboxone, that's what I like to say, sorry, um, four amphetamines, one barbiturate, and one benzo. And these are all newly pregnant patients. So you can imagine, I have two patients. I have a mom, right, and I have her baby. Um, so we were very excited to be able to launch this. We thought this was um, absolutely part of what um, are our core values, which you might have heard me sort of slow down and say. But as an organization, and as a really large organization across two states, um, up and down, we've got, right, Sopranos, North Jersey, and Jersey Shore. I'll leave it at that, right? And then we're off to Philly. So we're culturally different, um, but at our base, at our platform, are really who we are. And, and I believe in them. And you might say, oh, goodness, this lady's drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, but, but I believe in this. I, I think we think through these, whether we verbalize it to each other or not. Um, I think this is how we like to function um, and how we like to behave. So we put patients first. We inspire trust. We're always respectful and show compassion. We value each other. We're about each other as much as we care about our patients. Um, and I, I would say my core team especially, um, who I've mentioned most of them tonight or today, um, we build community. Yes, we expand into care centers and we have become a bigger group, but we really do work as a team. We're very open and, and honest. I get pushback. I've been told to choose my words wisely once. I, I took that in stride. Um, sometimes that hurts a little, but we, we definitely push back. I, we give feedback to each other and we connect with each other a, a, as a, a human being. We're definitely accountable. We're honest with each other. We do, and I, I love this line, um, we do what we say we will do. I say that to my 14-year-old and 16-year-old who are not listening today. They should be in school. Um, but I, I really like that because I think, I think that speaks to who we are. We act with integrity, and we try to serve with excellence. We set those high standards. We anticipate needs and exceed expectations. I, I, I think you could write this down as we put down pathways um, and the last is we're trying to grow and improve. And you might say that urine screening may not be innovative, um, but we're certainly embracing a, a new idea. Um, and the goal is to write, never stop improving. So I know you all think that this is rainbows and unicorns, right? <laughs> Woo, yay, this lady's nuts, right? Um, she's an obstetrician, it's all happy medicine. Um, this is a lot of work. This is hard, hard work. Sometimes I feel like I'm swimming with sharks and that I'm about to dive in. Um, there's no question on that. And there are, you know, I, I walk into a meeting of docs. There may be one at one care center. There may be three. And I, I know they are like, what are you making me do? And actually, sometimes it's like herding cats. This is from Greece, actually. Um, right? I mean, they're just all over the place. They don't pay attention. They don't come, sit, stay. You know, no hand commands like you do with a dog. I'm a dog person. So um, there are days I definitely feel like I, I'm about to go up a big snowy hill, right? <laughs> or get, try and fly over the Andes, right? Or wherever these are, I have no idea. So, uh, nah, it's got this off the internet. It's super cool. But the copyright's all good, just so you know. I made sure of it. There's a super thing on Google, if you didn't know, that you can check that. So you can download pictures. And this is one, too. And if you haven't seen National Geographic's Solo, I highly recommend. Long, many lives ago, when working for the Indian Health Service, I, I was a rock climber. Different body, but I... Um, so, don't life that hard. It says right. So uh, anyway, the, the gentleman who won the Academy Award was a, a gentleman named Jimmy, Jimmy Chin, and he's videotaping a man solo climbing Yosemite, who you'll see in this. And you're filming someone who might die. You're on the other side of that lens. And, and that movie, I, I could barely watch it. Um, but this is a gentleman who I, I don't ever feel like that. I have a team behind me. Um, and, and this man has too, and, and I think, though, this solo climber, to a certain extent, felt like there was a team behind him, but it's not. He's by himself. There are no, and he climbs Yosemite without a rope, without anything, and he memorizes the entire pathway, and he does it over and over and over again, um, bringing in tons of data, 
right? Looking at, at all, and it, it's fascinating, but I, I don't want to ever be that. I, I love being in the team I'm in. Um, I love being with the people I work with. Actually, I, I met with a doctor last night in another state that we're speaking to, and, and this woman was fabulous. She said to me, I sound cheesy, but I love my patients. I love my office. I love my partners. Um, and, and that's kind of where I'm at. I, I don't mind diving in with the sharks um, or looking at the snowy peak that I have to get over. Um, but a whole bunch of women rowing the boat forward, right? That, that's essentially what we're trying to do. Um, and I just like they're, they're all not like, you know, super young fit rowers, right? But that, that's the goal of, our, of what Axia is trying to do. Um, and, and I like being on that, that team. So that's who I am. Um, certainly, we have done enhanced recovery. Uh, I hope you all come to Sunday's talk because it certainly will tell you a lot of fun stuff that we're doing and definitely innovative, definitely progressive, and absolutely caring. So that's it. Thank you. That is a phenomenal um, presentation. Thank you so much for that. Well, it's fun. You know, I, I could have talked about ERAS. You're all going to hear about ERAS all weekend long. I thought I'd talk about something that we were successful at. Um, we can certainly talk about the decision-making process. Um, but I, as a young organization, um, we've only been around for two years. Um, I, I think uh, coming up with our mission statement, coming up with our core values, it, it really was part of the process. So I, I felt like sharing it. I certainly had my team log in from home. They had no idea what was being said today. They're probably all driving home thinking, yeah, she is kind of nuts, but they don't know that. And, um, and that has helped us do some amazing things. Um, we do, uh, what, 18,000 deliveries. Um, we do ERAS in several um, centers that have never done obstetrics. If you think about it, 1.3 million C-sections are done a year. Yeah, didn't you? We've had this conversation before. It's the biggest bed user Yes. To, in the hospital, yeah. right? So it's it's huge in the system. Absolutely. And we cut our hospital. I'm giving all the punches, and Dr. Kett will kill me if I keep doing this. But, you know, our particular institution, um, we went from 3.7 days down to 2.1 per hospital yeah, stay. Okay. Um, absolutely. Yeah, big time, right? So we think about that throughput for the hospital system itself. It was big. Yeah. And well, um, we've had great satisfaction out, outcomes and mobilizing patients. And we've decreased our opioid use by um, 87%. Um, Michael talked about that prescription for 15. Over 60% of our patients go home with none. So we don't have a set, but we do um, have a shared decision-making process. Um, most of our patients are opioid naive, mm -hmm. um, or I like to think they are, as I yeah. right? and And most of them are. I mean, you look at that. But it, um, the process of we actually, within our app, come up with why we're giving you less or why we think you should have less. Um, and it gives the patient sort of what their pain level is, how many, you know, on average, how, what are they taking in the hospital, and what would they go home with, um, so they can see that map. Um, and so I think we talked about being able to show patients that data, but really giving them an idea of what their expectation should be. Um, and then we follow them kind of like big brother is what I like to think. Um, so there is a third, I know I'm just babbling, that's right, you don't even have to be up there, right? Keep, keep going, so, girl, it's yeah. good. So there... American College of OBGYN talks about the, the third trimester and then a fourth trimester. And so right now, they talk about it. They don't know. They haven't been telling us how to do it. And so most of the time, I only have to follow a woman six, six weeks out from her delivery. Um, they actually are now recommending that we follow people six months out um, and looking at things like mood and, and um, breastfeeding, um, all, all of it. I mean, I, there's about 15 elements that they're recommending, but they give, don't give us a how. Um, they give us a lot about why, but they don't give us any kind of how. So our app, which was super fun to put together, <laughs> a lot of work, labor of love, as I like to call it my passion project at times. Um, and, and what it does is from every day, patient is pushed information or questions um, about what's going on and what expectations are, but also those questions are answered. And, and some of them are everything that would reflex to a phone call to the office, but I actually have a nurse who logs in and looks at it twice a day um, and also alerts um, to let us know that maybe we need to be more more attentive to that patient. 
So when it came to your experience with leading your group and, and creating this change, I mean, I kind of see why you chose the, the opioid question, um, but what was it that was really that really turned the corner for your group, especially for some of the laggards and those people that you, I mean, are you still struggling with those people or? Yes. Yes. And if they're listening. No. Um, we, we, we had a lot of adoption. Absolutely. I think the, um, I don't think the healthcare, you know, the number one um, preventable healthcare crisis right now is opioids. We all, we all know. I think everybody in the room probably knows it. I think most of us are believers. Yes, we had a lot of people who said, it's not going to be my patients. And one of the first phone calls I had, which I had to jump on with Dr. Krell, was a patient who was positive for morphine. And I had to jump on the call with a doctor. Because the doctor said, I don't, I don't believe this is positive. And I, th- I think this patient, this is a false positive. And, and we flexed it out. And we all thought morphine in the urine, that, that's that got to be short-lived. Like, and was she just admitted to the hospital? I mean, we, we went through the whole kind of work up and thinking about it and, and trying to be supportive of the physician who really thought, this, this, this woman, it's now in her chart. Is she going to lose her job? Is she, what are the implications of this whole whole thing but we um you know not only supporting the patient but the process we actually had it checked by a third lab and she was still positive and her repeat was still positive so there was a whole long conversation and an intervention and that's when we really went oh we we met we better start partnering with some addiction specialists um besides maternal fetal medicine um for some of these patients and and realizing that because mfm a little overwhelmed, and certainly knows how to do a lot of ultrasounds. I'm glad there's no MFM in the audience um, because they like to do ultrasounds and, and growth restriction and some of these issues that we have with, with real abuse. Um, but what are we doing about the actual addiction? So, um, yeah, we did, we did a lot of partnering, but a lot of the um, this turned around looking at what the crisis was. What can we do to change it? How can we be um, aligned with the patients? Um, and it's, this is voluntary, I should say. Nobody's, it's not mandated that you do it. People, patients decline. Um, we don't have that many that decline. Um, but it is in your chart that you declined. Um, What's the conversation that you have with the patient? Um, I'll be honest. Most patients, no problem. Sign me up. Yeah, pee in a cup. Next. You know, I mean, they, they, they are okay with it. Um, the patients that, okay, an amphetamine, we, we had a lady on Adderall that wasn't really telling us she was on Adderall, so that conversation became, okay, what are you doing on Adderall? And is it your ADD? Okay, what what, what do we need to do for you? Um, and, and that conversation should be get you into a geneticist and have a conversation about a medication that you've been on. Um, is the, you know, my conversation starts with, this is what we do for all of our patients. It's standard. Um, and we're, we're taking care of you, we're taking care of your baby. Um, and the implications of, of that, they're big. They're, this is a big deal. Um, and it's fascinating to me how many people have just done it. So, so I'm going to actually give you my mic since you're so close. And play. Thank you. I love your statement about how difficult it is, um, how hard it is. You have 275, somewhere between 270 and 275, apparently. Yeah. Um, actually. How do you how do you uh, coalesce, if you will, um, attitude to do something? Walk walk us through that. How do you how do you motivate? How do you communicate? So excellent question, actually. Um, so I just finished before walking in here today um, something called the Provider Pulse. I'm very proud of that. That is a just within Axia. We sent out to all providers. Today's which I don't want to completely get. It's all about marijuana use and pregnancy. I've, we drive that, that, that's driven by the, the um, clinical team on what topics to talk about, but that, that drives what we're doing and, and make sure that we're driving the same message. Uh, we do that not only with an office manager meetings, we have a town hall. So there's a whole team, right? They're not, you know, it's, it's not me telling you, you need to do this or that. This is become sort of a, that global network um, because we, we, like the OR, there's a set of people beyond the surgeon. Um, that's super important to make things happen. But we, we're big communicators across and try and be as transparent as we can. So as this came out and our survey came out, we, we announced the results of the survey. We then said, this is, this is what we've all decided to do. And originally, you know, we came together because we wanted the price of speculums and pap smear stuff to be cheap. Let's be honest, right? I mean, I want an economies of scale. There's no question there. Um, <laughs> 
But, and I say that joke all the time, but it's true. I mean, it, right? I mean, if you could all buy cheap, cheap, you're going to buy cheap, cheap. And, but we wanted quality. So we don't, we don't grab everybody in New Jersey, though it looks like it. And it's a super populated state. Um, and we, we absolutely um, wanted like-minded people, but we needed, we communicate tremendously. And whether that's email, that's phone calls, there's office management, I mean, I, town hall meetings, it is, um, it, to the point, it can always be relentless. And it start, this all started in September. I mean, it took us till February to get just a urine screen done. So, and, and choosing what, um, what we were going to test for, um, what we weren't going to test for, what, what were, could we do within our lab, what did we need to verify, did we have to send all of our positives out, was that the right thing to do? That's the right thing to do. So I'm going to push you a little bit. So yeah, somewhere between I the shot slide where somebody's trying to take a hunk of your, you know, calf and, and the all rowing together in the boat. Sure. There's a lot of gray. There's tons of gray. How do you manage to so some of it is um, with an app called Calm, but some of it is, <laughs> or breathe on my Apple Watch. Um, <laughs> but, but you're absolutely right. It, it comes from, some of the pushback is great. And I, I um, it's, some of it's tough. I mean, some of it's really tough. And some of the people are, are me, right? I, and I can name a few of them, but I won't hear, though I'd like to, because that would make me feel better. But I'm not going to do that. Push me a little bit, I might. But but you're right. It is okay. I'm swimming with sharks today. And but the goal is that you're moving this in the direction of bettering women's health. And I truly believe in that mission. Um, and I truly think that on a day to day process, if you are patient, and that's probably one of my big things. I, I didn't know my my 15 year old isn't going to tell you no way she is not. But I think I have a lot of patience. I'm also very consistent. Um, you have to stay on your message. And, and when I hear and I say, oh, they kind of have a lot to say, or they have some very good points, it's acknowledging that point, and maybe I'm a dog on a bone that will not let it go. And that's sometimes what you have to be. Um, I also think if you're, if you're truly doing something right for patients, it's the right thing, and you know you're the right person in the room, right? And, and that, yeah, there takes a little bit of, you know, I don't know, I can call that a lot of things, but um, I'll leave that alone. Um, so... I, um, I enjoy the challenge. Um, the hurting cat, the apathy probably bothers me more than the person who's pushing back. The person who's just like, yeah, whatever, and not doing it. We talked about, just talked about that. That, you know, not, I'll call that care center and say, you're not doing any direct screens. What's up? And, and, and I may actually visit them. And then I may look at, you're, you're collecting urine already. Here's the consent. I made the pathway for you. Um, so we, we, I had, we did that literally yesterday. So, yeah, I think that's part of probably who I am. That's all. Yeah. Perfect. Was that a good answer? I mean, Dr. Kent might say I'm a ball buster, but. Um. <laughs> that's right. Do you want to do some slide-up questions, Mark? Yeah, so do you share with your patients the risk of their developing dependency and the ways with which they might mitigate? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's, there's no question on that. Actually, it's on our app. It's a verbiage that all of my providers use that are using our, our program, our enhanced recovery program. I think um, we have to. Um, we actually in New Jersey have a box to check that says that I've actually told the patient that. Um, so it's uh, state law. So um, without question, we talk about um, dependence with uh, all of our patients, uh, especially if I have a patient who says, I'm going home with 15, 20, 8, whatever. I don't believe this boo hickey here. And it's that being patient with the patient and saying, no, I'm going to send you home with five. You haven't, you know, you've only taken, you know, a couple here. You're going to go home with five and there are refills and we have a way of following you. And you can come back to the office if you need to be assessed. So it's tough love. Uh, we're actually going to take a three minute break when we just sort out a couple of things here. So we're going to turn off the live streams at home. We'll be back with you very, very shortly for our final speaker of this session, which will be uh, absolutely fantastic, exciting close of this afternoon. So a big round of applause. Yep. Nick Jarrison here. Thank you for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, make sure you've subscribed to Top Med Talk on your podcatcher or however it is that you're listening to us at the moment. And you're spoilt for choice. We're on pretty much every single podcast platform you could think of. Uh, so make sure you've subscribed. Make sure you've engaged with us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. And 
make sure you've signed up for our email updates on topmedtalk.com. If you get yourself there, you'll find a website that contains all of the podcasts that we've ever done and it gives you the chance to sign up for our email updates. That way we can always get in touch with you and tell you what we're up to. Oh, and while you're online, check out ebpom.org forward slash meetings. While you're there, get excited about EBPOM London 2019, the London Perioperative Medicine Congress. It's on July the 2nd, and it's one of many meetings that EBPOM organises around the world in order to communicate the perioperative medicine message. Have a look, ebpom.org forward slash meetings.